The Wiz Kids had won it, Bobby Thompson had done it, and Yogi read the comics all the while. Rock and roll was being born, marijuana we would scorn. So down on the corner the national pastime went on trial. We're talking baseball, Klazuki. The Comfortably Zoned Radio Network proudly presents Genesis with Ian Kahanowitz and Mark Weiss. My baby dolls, it's good to be back with you again. We got the man with the plan in the house, the king of swing. Everything is good with this guy. He is the mad dog on the show. We got you, Mark Weiss. How are you, Mark? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, and I'm excited. This is going to be a landmark show for us, my friend. All right. Then it is good. As always, I'm your host, Ian Kahanowitz. He's the co-pilot, Mark, but you know he's a little bit more theatrical than me. So, you know, I, I let him wear the clown suit. I just take the rubber nose. And we got a great guest today. We got we got former Major League Baseball star Jim Gosker, who in the 60s and 70s uh, played for a few teams. We're going to get it into, into um, his career. And, uh, you know, he's played for people like Alvin Dark and Gil Hodges. And um, he took hitting instruction from the great Ted Williams. And that's just the surface of things. He was an original Seattle pilot, and anyone born after 1969 does not know what I'm talking about because there was no Seattle pilot into the 70s. He was also on both of the 1969 and 1973 National League champion Mets, and, of course, he was in Jim Booten's book, uh, Ball Four, uh, and he's been made infamous for muttering the words, yeah, sure. Without any further ado, welcome to the show, Jim Gosker. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here on a beautiful, sunshiny February morning. Well, it's great to have you. Now, um, now Jim, you played for a, a lot of teams in, within a 10-year um, span. Um, you know, first of all, you were drafted by the Red Sox, which I am. Tell me a little bit about um, your time up until the time you were drafted. Well, I'll tell you, I was when I was uh, playing here, I was playing semi-pro ball, and uh, two or three different scouts come in, but we finally settled on the Boston Red Sox, and it worked out very well for me. Um, I had a chance to um, play in the minor leagues, playing with uh, Winston-Salem, and I started out with Winston-Salem, and the following year, they had to protect me under the bonus rules. So I was fortunate. I was at uh, at the right place at the right time. Hey, Jim, do you think that the whole bonus rule, which, you know, if you made a certain amount in bonus, you had to stay a full year on the major league roster, do you think that that hurt a lot of young ball players in their development because they were, you know, not getting into game situations where, as if they were in the minors, they'd have been playing every day and really improving? Well... In my situation, um, they had uh, an option whether they could protect me after the first year or if I wasn't protected, then I was uh, eligible to be picked up uh, by any other team. There was two players, myself and Gage Naudain, and they decided to protect me. Um, we both played. Um, Gage, I think, played in Class C ball that first year, and I played in Class B ball. And uh, they chose to protect me. Um, it was good in one respect, and another respect that was not good. Um, the good part about it was is I got a year in the pension plan, and I learned a little bit about what Major League Baseball was was like. Um, in the bad respect, I didn't get to play that much. But um, I learned a lot. I had a, a, an opportunity to, to play with uh, some of the best, and, you know, just to be part of that was uh, was a learning experience for me. Now, Let me ask you on that TV, I was, gonna, I was just going to ask a quick question. I'm sorry. You know, yes. I was going to say, when you were on That's that TV, you you got to you got to see the young Carl Yastrzemski. I mean, those were his, you know, early years, and obviously he was trying to get out of Ted Williams' shadow, which 
I don't know that anyone could ever really do. What did you notice about him in, when he was playing in that, in that young era, you know, for him? And did you see that he was eventually going to become that mega star that he actually became toward the end of the decade? Well, I thought Carl was um, very articulate in regards to uh, his hitting and his fielding. I mean, he, he took it very seriously. He worked very hard on his hitting and his fielding, and uh, I was impressed to watch him uh, watch his work ethics. He just uh, he just was all baseball. Um, you know, he, he, there was nothing that, that, that he couldn't do, and he always tried different things. But he was very successful, um, not only being from the Boston area, but because he had such great credentials. Um, I enjoyed watching him play. I mean, he he could play left field in Fenway Park with the best of them. And um, he just was a hard worker. He worked very hard. Uh, You'd see him out there all the time, um, early, taking batting practice, fielding. He just uh, he just wanted to perfect his game, and he he did very well. I mean, I I just enjoyed watching him play. I enjoyed being his teammate, and um, you know he, he was very successful. Um, so you know things worked out for him. Um, he wasn't a Ted Williams, but I'll tell you what, he was pretty close. I I think it had to be tough for a guy to. Come right in after Ted Williams retires. That's that's got to be. I mean, no one fills those shoes, but just the pressure alone of knowing that you're you're coming into that spot that Ted actually held down for over 20 years, I, I think could have been a lot of pressure on Carl too. I mean, did you feel that that was the case? Did did he ever express that, or he was just such business like he was just working it at it? No, he just uh, you know his his work ethic was uh, outstanding. I mean, he, he, you can't. You can't say anything bad about him because he was so into playing the game of baseball. I think um, I don't think that, that the Ted Williams era had anything to do with him. He had his own agenda. Um, he knew that being from the Boston area, it was going to be tough. You know, they were going to be critical. Yeah, but he overcame that. Yeah, he didn't let that pull him down to uh, you know to a, to a point where he. He, he was struggling. He, I never saw Carl struggle. I mean, he'd, he'd, he'd have times where he'd uh, he'd go, you know, two or three games without getting a hit, but he always bounced back. And that's that's something that's very tough to do when you're playing in the big leagues because you can get down on yourself because of, you know, you're in the spotlight. And uh, he handled it very well. I uh, I was impressed. I, I, I mean, watching somebody like that, he always tried to. To uh, you know, instill what he has done into your situation, and I uh, I tried to you know to, to do some of the things, but you know his ability was a lot more a lot better than mine. Let yeah. me ask you this. Oh, sorry about that. You go. You go. All right. All right. Uh, you know, Jim. Let me ask you something. Now, when you were playing in the Winston Salem uh, affiliate. In the Carolina League, what's interesting here is you hit 283, 19 home runs, 83 RBIs. You made it to the um, postseason league with, with with players like Rusty Staub, Tony Perez, Mel Stoudemire, and Rico Petroselli. But yet you you consider that almost like a curse, you know, because um, you said you thought of yourself as a slugger. Uh, but I don't see a problem like that. Why would somebody like Johnny Pesky see that as a problem? Well, Johnny had to play, you know, he had to play the established stars. And, um, you know, he he talked to me when I was up there. I mean, he explained the situation, and I understood that. You know, the the, the, the good thing about it was that he gave me the opportunity to to get a couple of bats when we were here in Detroit. And this is my hometown, or north of Detroit. So I had a lot of people that came down to, you know, to watch when we came into town. And I was fortunate to get my first big league hit right here in Detroit off Frank Larry. And um, that was a big thrill for me. And I thanked Johnny for giving me the opportunity to do that. And, 
You know, I respected the man. I, I, I thought he was a, a real good manager, and he handled the situations well. And um, he was good. He was good for Boston. Now, on on those Boston teams, you got to play with some interesting young guys who were on their on their way up. T- tell us a little bit about a guy who's really been forgotten, unfortunately, because he had such a great start in his career, but then he got injured, actually got hit in the eye. It would tell us a little bit about working, uh, playing with Tony C. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Tony and I were roommates on the road um, when I finally came up in, in 65 when I was up there. And uh, just a great kid. He had such a great future. Um the thing that I enjoyed about him was that he he, he played the game hard, um, and he was idolized by a lot of the people there in, in uh, Boston because he was from I think Swamp Scott or someplace around there. He was he was he was a local boy, mm-hmm. and pardon me. Yeah, I was agreeing with you. I think he was from Revere, which is like really really local. Yeah, he uh, but I, but he. You know, and and Tony Tony had that little cockiness in him, and I loved it because he his idea was, hey, I'm going to beat you, you know, and and it, that's hard to find. That's hard to find in 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 young young guys like that. And he just, I mean, he was he was a pleasure to be around. And you know, when I was traded, and the incident happened in Boston where he got hit in the head, that, that really, really destroyed his opportunity, I think, to become great because he was just that type of individual and, and he was a gung-ho individual. But I think after that, he was a bit gun-shy to go to the plate, you know, because he always stood right on top of the plate. And, um, you know, when you get nailed anywhere in your body, it's, it, it's a, a lasting effect, but, Getting hit in the head is is really tough. I mean, he came up at 19 years of age, and how he didn't win Rookie of the Year with the numbers that he had it just amazes me in the first place. But he, he had four years off the charts. By, by the time he was 22, he had over 100 home runs. I mean, he yeah, was on the I mean, fast track to go to Cooperstown. Well, he was he was built for that park. Stood on top of the plate, strictly a dead pull hitter. Um, very seldom hit the ball the other way. I mean, it just, he was built for that park. And I, you know, it, when I saw what happened when he got hit, I, I think it was, was it Fisher that hit him or somebody from, from, uh, from the Yankees? The, the, was it the Yankees or was it from yeah. the Angels? But it, you know, that was a lasting effect on that young man. And, uh, he just never was the same after that. And, it was a shame because he had such a bright future. And, you know, everybody was pulling for him. Everybody was excited that he was getting a chance to to perform. He was performing very well. And it was it was sad. It was a sad, sad situation. Now, Jim, let me ask you this. But you were traded to Kansas City, the athletics. And, by the way, do you know Jimmy Driscoll? Very well. He's on my Facebook. Oh, yeah, we're good buddies. In fact, we last uh, September we had that big uh, outing. Reunion. In the city. And, uh, yeah, I, Jimmy, and I, Jimmy and I are good friends, yes. I speak to Jimmy probably once a week by phone. He's he's in New Hampshire. I'm in Mass. i got to go visit him up there in New Hampshire. But anyway, you played, um, you played with Dick Williams, I believe. He was your manager. And you played for Charlie O. How was how was uh, the whole building of the A's at that time, and 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 how did you fit into that building? Because they were starting to become a major factor before they moved to Oakland in '68. Well, when I got, I was supposed to be. I was told by Mr. Yawkey after the '65 season that I was an untouchable. Well, that kind of scares you when you say you're an untouchable. Anyway. Come trade deadline, they uh, traded me to Kansas City. Now, I had hit well against Kansas City, and I think that's the reason why Kansas City uh, opted to to pick me up. Um, in return, uh, Boston got 
some pretty good players. They got Tartable, they got John Wyatt, and the following year they won the, they won the pennant, I think, 68, 69, 68, I guess it was. But anyway, when I got traded, um, to this day, Billy Herman never told me I got traded. We were in Cleveland, and we just started a road trip, and my high school, my little league coach was at the game. He called me after the game. He says, you've been traded. I said, what? He said, you've been traded to Kansas City. So I never did find out. I contacted Kansas City, talked to Alvin Dark. He said, I want you out here tomorrow. I said, okay. So I had to fly back to Boston and get my stuff. He said, you're going to platoon. So I platooned when I got out there with Joe Nasik, and it was very nice because Alvin called us both aside. He says, Jim, you're going to hit against right-handers. Joe, you're going to hit against not left-handers. So we knew our jobs. But I'll tell you what, I just thoroughly enjoyed playing for Alvin Dark. He was probably, I, I, in, in my time of playing, he was the best manager I ever played for. I mean, he just, and I'll tell you the reason why is he always, kept you in the game if you weren't playing. He'd come down and he'd say, what do you think we should do in this situation? I'm thinking, geez, you're the manager, Skip. <laughs> you know, but he kept you involved. And that was something that a lot of managers that I played for, you know, they did not, they did not interact so very well with the players. And that's a big thing if you're managing. You've got to be able to get along with the players and, uh, you know, to get them to perform at their highest level, and uh, it's a tough situation. But I did love Kansas City. I really did. Now, when you played on that Kansas City, those Kansas City teams, uh, Charlie Finley was signing young players and, and obviously building the franchise. Of course, he was doing a lot of public relations stuff, which was kind of his thing, you know, milking cows and all kinds of cool stuff like that to kind of bring people into the ballpark. But the young players that he was bringing in, did you get the sense – Back then, like when he was bringing in Catfish and guys like like Joe Rudy and obviously Reggie uh, and uh, I'm trying to think who else, uh, Sal, uh, Sal Bando. Did you get the feeling that this was like the nucleus of what could really be a pennant winning team? Well, see, at that time, in 67 and 68, we had uh, those guys were playing in double A ball. And we knew eventually that, that Charlie was going to bring them up. But, you know, you, you strive and you, you, you got to move on. And these kids were good kids, good young kids, Rudy and, and Bando and Reggie Jackson. I remember uh, one instance where we were – he was going to bring – Finley wanted to bring Reggie Jackson up for one, for one game. Alvin Dark said to me, he says, i got to sit you. i got to – this phenom coming in. I said, whatever. <laughs> so he, he brought, he brought uh, Reggie in. Reggie played one game. He struck out four times. And Dark says he's got to go back to double-A ball. He couldn't hit the curveball. But I'll tell you what, he learned how to hit the curveball. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, he figured one, that one out. <laughs> he, he, he became one of the premier hitters and really a nice man. You know, um, when he was coming, when he came, we had a, a, a reunion here last September, and he came to the reunion, and what a gracious person. He came in, he looked at me, he said, Jimmy, how you doing? And I said, well, not bad, Rich. <laughs> but he was just, you know, that he was very cordial, very down to earth. But I'll tell you what, he was probably the strongest individual I ever saw as far as uh, generating power with when he when he hit the ball. He was amazing. And I said, Reggie, I don't know. I said, I've never seen anybody as strong as you. He says, you know, Jim, he says, I never lifted weights either. I said, wow, what a physique. But what a nice man. But, you know, getting back to those, bringing up all those, those young players, uh, uh, Finley had an idea. He had an idea. He says, I'll get them, bring them all up at one time. And, he was successful doing that. And then, of course, he got all that great pitching to go along with those young players. And I think the shame of it is for that franchise that they did win the three in a row, but I get the feeling if if Finley didn't break up the team because of 
finances, they probably could have won like five or six championships in the 70s. Well, Charlie didn't like to spend a lot of money. <laughs> he was that. a tightwad. <laughs> yeah. Um, his theory was if you made over $40,000, I'm going to trade you. <laughs> I mean, that was when, when we were there in 68. 67 and 68, 66 and 67. He said, you know, if anybody's making big bucks, I, I, I got to move them. And that was, you know, when he got rid of Harrelson and he just gave Harrelson his release, Harrelson goes up to Boston and uh, gets about an $80,000 bonus and uh, helps them win the pennant. So, you know, it, Charlie kind of, hurt himself in that respect, because Harrelson was probably one of our better hitters at that time. Let me ask you this. When you guys moved from Kansas City to Oakland, was that, was that an exciting time, or were people like truly sad to leave Kansas City, which from, for, for all intents and purposes I've heard is a great baseball town? Well, when we moved out there, um, five of us stayed out and worked in public relations, and we'd go around to the the different organizations, and, you know, just get them acclimated to the fact that we were going to be in Oakland. Um, we played there in the Oakland Coliseum, I guess. It, it was not the most exciting place to play, but it was always so cold out there. I, you know, you had to wear long sleeve shirts because it, the wind would come in right over the mountains there and it would come down at night. It was terribly cold. Even in the, you know, in the, in the July and August, it, it, it was not, was not a warm place to play. But they drew, they started to draw a lot of fans out there and, um, you know, it, I think the colors of the uniforms, the different, uh, you know, white shoes and the whole bit was was a novelty at the time, and it, it, it brought a lot of people into the park, and that was the name of the game for Charlie, you know, get as many people in the park as you can. So, and, you know, it worked out. I enjoyed working out there. I, I enjoyed – we lived in Alameda, and uh, we were a short distance from the ballpark. But, you know, it was it was nice, but it was cold. <laughs> I, I can totally agree with you because I used to work out there and I'd go to A's games and it was cold and that place was like a cavern. Yeah, it was. It wasn't uh, the most exciting place to play in, but uh, you know it was. I don't know. I, I guess recently or in the last few years, it's it's uh, you know it's become a very unique place to play. So I don't know. Let me ask you this, um, Jimmy. Um, then you went to the Mets, and um, how is your relationship between Gil Hodges and yourself? Because I hear he was a very, very bright man, and he was very fair to the players. I speak to his daughter, Irene, so I might be biased in this. But, uh, well, you know, I'm biased. To... Yeah, I know. I know you are. But uh, how is your relationship? How is he as a manager? i tell you what. I thought Gil was a great manager. You know, the, the, the thing about Gil was – he never said much. In other words, he would never stomp around. He'd just sit there in the dugout and observe. And if something happened that he didn't like, he would talk to the player after the ball game, away from the rest of the players. You know, he never showed anybody up. And, you know, to see somebody like that, it, it, it's classy. He's a, he was a very classy manager. I mean, he, he, he knew what he wanted to do. He explained it to the players, what has to be done, how to do it, and he let them go about their business. Like, and like, if, if they, if they screwed up or had a, a problem, he would never berate him in front of the rest of the players. He always called them aside, say, hey, this is what we should have done. Let's not do something like that again. He was impressive. I really, I was impressed to watch him handle situations in the game. Um, he was very smart, very articulate, and he was well liked by all the players. Did you learn anything from him? Yeah. That, that, 
Did you learn anything yeah, from Gil? Shot to go from Joe Schultz in the same season to Gil Hodges. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's, that's a real shock. You're going 180 degrees. <laughs> that's from going like A to Z real quick. <laughs> that's it. Now, uh, let me ask you. Was, uh, was, sorry about that, Jim. Was Gil, did you learn some good hitting tips from Gil? Because they said he had these strong hits. Or was he more of a pitching kind of manager because he had Kuzman and he had Siva? You're talking about Gil, Hodges? Yeah, yeah. Gil didn't have to say too much of the pitchers. We had pretty good pitching at that time. Yeah. I mean, when you got, you got and, the and Rube Walker handled there. those guys. <laughs> yeah, you got the big boys out there. You don't have to say too much of the pitchers. But no, he, you know, he was very, and you know, very laid back. He just, he did, and he impressed me for that respect because, you know, he sat there. He observed whatever was going on, and then he would, if, if there was something that he didn't like, he, he took care of the situation after the game. I mean, it was it was a pleasure to watch him, how he handled the situation during the game. He said at the beginning of the season, I think I want to, I don't, I want to, I don't want to mess the quote up, but he said, do you think this team could win 85 games? And all the coaches agreed that that was a team that they thought could win 85 games. He goes, well, if I'm worth anything as a manager, I should be able to get us to win another 10 or 15 games and get us to 100, and maybe we can win this pennant. And I, do you think that he had a profound effect on, on that miracle team to be able to win all of those games and get the timely hitting and the timely pitching? Because a lot of people tend to say, well, managers don't make that big of a difference. But people around here really feel that Gil made a huge difference, and that was one of the major reasons that team went on to to be the team of destiny. Well, there's no question that, the, you know, it, it, as a player, if you respect your manager, if you understand what he's trying to tell you and work with you, uh, that's – that is a hundred percent better than to have somebody that you're you're unsure of. You know, he he had that effect on the players that, you know, you listen to me and I can help you and you can help me. And 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 it was impressive. It was nobody had ever have I ever heard anybody say anything bad about Gil Hodges. It was, they always respected him. They respected him as a person, and they highly respected him as a manager well you're never going to hear ian or i say anything bad about gil hodges because like we said we're biased we we think we think that man belongs in cooperstown and that's one of our goals anyway is to you know hopefully create some awareness to get that guy up there because between his playing career and his managing career and just his sheer personality and 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 just how good a human being he was i i just can't see why he's not there it freaks me out <laughs> Well, I hope that, uh, you know, the writers would, would take into consideration the fact that uh, he was so successful not only as a player but as a manager. And, um, you know, if, 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 if they take this, this situation and, and, and really look it over, I think that he should, you know, be in the Hall of Fame. Now, Jim, you got to the team. They were like two games down. Uh, to the Cubs and for the for the division title, and you must have been their good luck charm because then they run away with the division after you show up there. So, there's tell us a little bit about some of the the things that 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 you did. I know you were the guy who came in there and and you know played some defense when 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 and Cleon came out of games and stuff like that. And you played in that classic doubleheader against I think it was against Pittsburgh where uh, I think it was. Don Cardwell, and I forget who the other pitcher was, but the, the two of those guys threw back-to-back -back shutouts in a doubleheader, and that team just got on its way. Well, I'll tell you what. We relied a lot on our pitching. I mean, we had, you know, we uh, hitting-wise, we were not a home-run hitting team, line drive hitting team, you know, moving guys up when we had to move them up a base. Um, but we relied mostly on our pitching. And, you know, when you have Seaver, Matlack, and uh, Kuzman, and McGraw in the, in the bullpen, you know, you know your starters are going to go seven innings, at least seven innings, and then you come in with McGraw and... Uh, and Ronnie Taylor. Ron, Ron Taylor. Uh, we come in with those two guys, 
you know, you're pretty well set. But, you know, the, the, the guys uh, the guys knew what we had to do, it, 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 and they understood what the situation was, you know, the time frame that we had to do it in, and everybody just, you know, just really worked hard to, to make this goal. And I'll tell you what, 69 was the most exciting I've ever seen, you know, a city and, and uh, the players. You know, they accomplished something that, that, that was really they weren't projected to accomplish. And, you know, it's, it's a great tribute to the team, to the coach, to the coaches, uh, to everybody. And, and, and it was just a, a great situation. I was lucky to be in that situation, be up there at that time. And um, it's something I'll never forget. Let me ask you this, Jimmy. Um, with the 69th season, was it like a culture shock? Because that was the first year of a championship series. As you know, you played through it. You just won the pennant if you won the, 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 um, the division. How did you feel about now you had uh, playoffs to get to the World Series? Well, you know, you always want to accomplish and get to the best part of, of anything. And to get to the World Series, you know, this is the ultimate goal, I think, of every player that puts on a uniform. It's the same way in football, the Super Bowl, in hockey, the uh, Stanley Cup. You know, you want to strive to get to the highest level and, and compete for the biggest prize. And I think that's in every athlete's mind that, 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 that has ever played the game or played sports, and, you know, it, when you achieve and get to that highest goal, it's just such a rewarding uh, situation, and, you know, you kind of get used to it, and you want to say, hey, that was fun. Let's see if we can do it again, and it's, it, it's hard to accomplish. You know, I've played with so many guys at, that, that had played in the minor leagues, got to the big leagues, and never had the opportunity to be involved in a championship series. And I feel very fortunate that, that I had it twice. And, you know, like I said, a lot of guys never have the opportunity to do it. And, uh, you know, it's it's something that everybody wants to do, but not everybody can do. Now, I, I, I can only imagine that during the, the time that from the September run all the way up through October when the Mets finally did win the World Series that year, I could imagine that, that you guys could go anywhere out on the town and you weren't paying for drinks. People were celebrating you guys. Well, you know, when you get in that situation and, uh, you know, everybody knows you, everybody wants to be your friend, but you got to yeah. pick and choose, you know, you got to... You got to pick and choose the right people to be around, and you know, fortunately, nobody had any problems. Everybody got along with, you know, with the outside uh, uh, problems that you know, if you, with with people that you really don't know. So, you know, and, and we were fortunate, and uh, at least I was fortunate. I never had any incidents where I had any problems with anybody, but. Yeah, everybody knows you, and everybody wants to be your friend, and and that's good. You know, that's that's a good thing. Now, when you got to the Mets, one of your old KC teammates, the glider Ed Charles, was on the Mets roster. How how good how good was it for him in his final year to to win a championship? I mean, you talk about guys who never get there, and he got there in his final year and retired right after that. Yeah, you know, I saw him this, I think it was at a 69 Met signing this last year, last spring. And I saw Eddie up there. And uh, I said to him, I said, Eddie, how are you doing? And he said, not too good, Jimmy. You know, he, said he was walking with the cane and, and uh, you know, his wife brought him in there to the, to the signing show. And, but Eddie, you know, very quiet young man, and he just he just went about and did his business. Never said too much. Just went out and played, and very impressive. He just uh, he just enjoyed the game, enjoyed playing, and um, you know I I was happy for him. I was happy that he he got a chance to you know to to experience the championship season. Let me ask you this, Jimmy. You um. 
you were um, instructed by uh, Teddy Williams regarding hitting. We know that he put out a book, The Science of Hitting. Now, in comparison to the other managers and hitting instructors uh, you had, how was Teddy Ballgame? You know, the, the, the thing that impressed me, my dad took me to my first major league game down in Detroit. And Ted Williams at that time was, was playing left field. And we were sitting in the left field area, and my dad, who was very quiet, said, watch him. And I said, okay. And he went about his business. He gets up to bat, and he, Frank Larry, I think, was pitching, and he struck him out. And I watched him walk back to the dugout, my dad said, watch. So I said, Dad, what am I watching? He says, watch. So I, he gets in the dugout, and he sits there, and he sits there, and I said, Dad, what am I watching for? He said, watch, and watch and see what happens next time he comes up. Next time he come up, he hit a home run up in the <laughs> center field bleachers off Larry. So when we go to, when I get finally signed with them, I go to spring training, and who's there but Ted Williams? And I'm in awe. I said, my gosh. I said, greatest hitter in the world. And I said, he's here. And he would be in the, near the batting cage. We'd go down to the batting cage, and he would, we'd get in the batting cage, and you'd hit. And the greatest thing about Ted Williams, he would never say anything to you while you're hitting in the batting cage. But when you come out of the cage, he'd look at you, and he'd say, hey, let's try this. And, you know, you say, okay, let's try this. And that was the way he instructed hitting. He never come out and said, you have to do it this way. He always say, let's try it this way. What a great man he was. I just, you know, he, he would hit, he would take batting practice, and he's 40, 42 or 44 years old. He'd be out there taking batting practice. Mom Bouquet and those guys would be throwing to him, and he'd just be ripping the ball. But he just, he was just, he was phenomenal. Just an absolute phenomenal individual, and he did not like the sports writers. <laughs> I, did I think you're being kind course. when you say he didn't like the sports writers. <laughs> <laughs> he always told me, he said, Jimmy, don't say anything to those guys. I said, okay, Mr. Williams, <laughs> whatever you say. But what, a, what an inspiration, you know, and I had a picture taken with him, and I have it here, but I, I could kick myself in the butt for not having it signed because, to me, he was the greatest. He was the best hitter I had ever seen. And, the, you know, he was just one super nice man. Uh, I remember hearing a story about him where he claimed that he would ask the players how many seams from the ball hit the bat when you swung. And players would be – these are major league players, obviously, guys like you who have, who have great eye-hand coordination. And they would say, like, how, I wouldn't know that. I, I never – I can't tell. And he would say, I could tell. And then in his, like, late 50s, he was hitting batting practice, and he would say how many seams hit of, the, of, the, of the ball hit the bat. And then they would look at the slow-motion video, and darned if he got it right almost 90% of the time. The guy must have had the oh, most he, incredible eyesight. He had, he had the most incredible eyesight. And, he'd, you know, he, he would say, he'd say, you know, Look at this. He, he, he'd actually sit in the bat and cage and said, this is what I want you to look for. Look here, look here, look here. And I said, wow. You know, after a while, you get, you get to a point where you just, it, it, it's automatic. And he said, he said, you, you know, he said, let me tell you a couple things. He said, first off, he says, you're going to get a good pitch to hit every time you go up there. You're going to get at least one good pitch to hit. He said, don't miss it. And I said, well, I guess you're right, Ted. He says, you know, they, they say that guys don't guess. He says, you guess all the time. He says, but if you know who the pitcher is and what he's going to throw, he says it's a, it's a lot easier to hit than if you go up there and, and, and don't know what this guy is going to throw. So be very conscious of what, you know, what, what situation you're in, what, what this guy throws. And he says, uh, you'll be successful. And Did he have the right. philosophy of go up there hunting fastballs? Because I know he was the, – the pitch that he hated the most was the slider, and he didn't really want to ever see that in a situation. But did he, did he coach you guys to hunt the fastball and get the best one and rip it? Yeah. 
Yeah, he said, you know, he said, you get a good, you get, you're going to get a good pitch to hit. He said, I want you to be comfortable in the batter's box. He says, I want plate coverage. And he says, I want you to, to, to think. Plate coverage, think, and, and, uh, you know, um, relax. He said, that's the name of the game. He said, I see so many guys go into the batting cage and they get all tight, tensed up. He said, no, you don't. He says, like chopping wood. He says, when you take a sledge or take a hatchet and hit a tree stump, he says, you don't grip it tight and hit it, do you? And I said, well, no. He says, it would hurt your hands. He says, you grab it loosely, and when you make contact, then everything tightens up. I mean, he was smart. He really was smart. And you know the, the theories that he gave you on hitting. It, I mean, it was a, it was a joy, not only because it's coming from him, because or and because it's it, it's teaching you how to play the game, how to hit. He was impressed. God, I enjoyed it. So you you think greatest hitter of all time? No doubt. No doubt. No doubt in my mind, he was the best. I mean, for in my era. Now, you know. It, it, People will say, well, DiMaggio was pretty good, too. I said, yeah. And I was fortunate to have him as a coach, too. <laughs> you know, so. Well, now we got to hear this story because, because I didn't even real I knew that DiMaggio did work with the Oakland A's when, when they came out to the coast, but I, I definitely have to hear this story about Joe D. Well, he, Joe again was, was, was on the, let me compare him with Hodges. He was very quiet. He would sit there and he'd watch and, and, and not be boisterous, would just be very calm, very calm, and he would take you off to the side and he'd say, okay, this is what, what you want to do. Now you've got him and you've got, and you got uh, Williams and you're comparing the two, but you take the stuff that you need. In other words, he might tell you something that's different from what Williams would tell you, but you take what you need out of that. And that that impressed me. You know, you, you take certain work ethics from one person, certain work ethics from another person, kind of put them together, and you got yourself something pretty good. And uh, I think so. Uh, Joe was Joe was a quiet man. Like I said, he was like Hodges. He didn't say too much. Uh, if you ask him something, he'd be glad to to help you out. But he just was not one of these boisterous. Um, you know, teachers that would come out and start screaming and howling. He was very quiet, and it was nice. It was nice to have him around. You know, he was he was just a great person. And would you think that working with with Ted would have been better for you because he's a lefty, you're a lefty, and you know that, that type of you know you know that perspective being being a little bit better? Or would you just think hitting is hitting, and if you're talking to Joe D or talking to Ted, you just listen? I, it, that's that's the key. Just listen. Take what you need from from both of them. You know they were both great hitters, but you know one was from the right side, the other one's from the left side. So you know you're comparing apples and oranges as far as that situation goes. But but they were both great hitters. They both had their own um, way of doing it, and uh, you know you listen to them. You, you pick up little. Things. This is the way I should hold the bat. This is the way my stance. You know, I mean, it's just it, it's always a lot of adjustments when you're when you're hitting. You, you never stay in the same place. You always mm-hmm. kind of move around in the box. You move around and you know, you, you hands in a different situation all the time, whichever which is comfortable for you. But the pitchers are a little smart. You know, they'll they'll find your weaknesses. You got to adjust as a hitter. And just as well as they're adjusting as a pitcher. So, um, you know, from the perspective of taking um, points from either one of them, I said it was great that I had the opportunity to, you know, to have two people like that. And, and, and you know, you can go back and look in your career and say, wow, I had two of the best coaching men. So, I was now, did Joe work with you guys on fielding, too? Because, obviously, I mean, you're, one of your trademarks in your career was you hustled and you were a great glove man. And, obviously, Joe was probably the, one of the greatest fielding center fielders ever. My grandfather used to say that at the crack of the bat, he went to the spot and he waited for the ball. He never had to run or dive or anything like that. Joe was always there. Did he work with you guys on the fielding aspect of it, too, or is he just there purely for hitting? Well, you know – I learned one thing my first year in pro ball, 
and I had an opportunity to play for Eddie Popowski, who was a manager in the Boston organization for many a year. And my first year in Winston-Salem, he called me aside, and Pop was a, a little man with beady blue eyes, and, you know, when he looked at you, he would look right through you, you know. But, but he <laughs> told me, he called me aside, he said, listen, if you want to make the big leagues, I want you to hustle. And I said, what do you mean, Pop? He says, I want you to run in and out the field hard, no slow stuff, back and forth. He says, you want to be noticed. And he says, you'll get noticed. And by God, I did. You know, and I've always, he taught me how to play the game, how to hustle, and how to keep your mind in the game. And I respected him. He was my first manager, and I've always respected Eddie Popowski. But he taught me how to play. You know, he taught you the, the, how to play the game. And I remember my first, when I first came up with, with Boston, when Herman was managing, in 65 I come up, in the middle of the year, I come right up at All-Star break, Geiger had broke his wrists, and Lenny Green broke his ankle, so I was a center fielder. And I'd run in and off the field, and Herman called me aside, and he said, uh, he says, I don't want you to run so hard off in and off the field. And I kind of looked at him and I said, what? He says, well, you're showing up the other players. I says, Mr. Herman, I don't care if I show up the other players. If you don't like the way that I play, then don't start me. I said, I'm not out here to, to make friends or to, you know, to show up players. This is the way I play the game. This is the way I've always played the game. If you if you're not satisfied with the way that I'm hustling or that I'm playing, then then don't play me. Never heard Let me ask. Word from them. I'll tell you to be fair. A lot of those Boston teams in in that early '60s era, they could have used a little more hustle, like like the hustle you had, because they weren't winning an awful lot of games. Well, he told me he says I was showing Carl up, and I said, Carl is making a hundred thousand dollars. I'm making ten thousand dollars. I said, I'm here to play the game. And, and, you know, I said, Mr. Herman, if you don't like the way I'm playing the game, then take me out of the game. And I, I got to ask you a question, though. He, he said that you were showing Carl. Did Carl ever come to you and say, hey, you're showing us up or anything like that? Or was this just in the manager's head? No, no, no. Never said a word. But Herman, Herman come to me and said, you know, you're showing up the team by hustling off the field. I said, I'm sorry, sir, but that's the way I play the game. Jim, and I coach me, girls travel softball, and when I see one of my kids running out like that, I point to that kid, and I tell the other girls, I say, you, you can't keep up. Look at that effort. I want to see that from everyone. That's something yep. I use as a teaching tool. Yep, and I, I, coached, uh, I coached a JV team about three years ago up here in, in north of town here, a guy called me, wanted me to coach the JVs, and I said, well, okay. And I, I told the kids right off the start, I said, listen, they got two things that, that, that I want you to do. I said, I want you to hustle in and off the field. You're there for two hours. And I said, I want you to hustle in and off the field. If you don't, you'll be sitting on the bench with me. And I also want you to enjoy playing the game. Don't be discouraged if the guy strikes you out. You come back and say, hey, I'll get him next time. I don't want any of that stuff on my team. You know, you go out there, you have fun, you hustle, play, and enjoy it. And let me ask you the, let me, let me ask you the last question, Jimmy, because we're uh, running out on time, and it's a two-part question. One, you returned to the Mets uh, in 1973. How is the aura of the 73 Mets, because Gil had just died a year before, different uh, than 1969, and how did you get along with Yogi and Yogi as a coach? Yogi was a great guy. <laughs> you know, Yogi was Yogi was not the manager that Gil was. Yogi was kind of a free-going spirit, let's go out and have fun, um, you know, and, and uh, he just, he, he was more of a figurehead. Um, Gil was a manager, and I mean Yogi, Yogi knew the game, but Yogi did not have the 
he did not know about, you know, the the aspects of what we do in certain situations. I mean, it, but he had the players. We had the players. You know, they they pretty much carried the ball club. Uh, Yogi would say, "Hey, go out there and have fun," you know, which which was fine. But um, Gil, like I said, was a was a very articulate manager, and, and Yogi was more of a, more of a free spirit. But <laughs> in '73, you know, we had we had a good team. Again, we had great pitching, and uh, the hitting was a, a lot better. We had you know a few better ball players or better hitters at that time. But you know, it was a situation where. We we they played hard and they enjoyed what they did, but um, I mean it was a tribute to people of New York and the, and and the uh, you know the, the guys themselves. It was a it was a good feeling. Um, probably could have won the World Series in '73, but they kind of had a problem. I, I I don't know whether the pitching got a little down or what, but you know it was fun. It was a, like I say I, I I'm lucky I was at the right place at the right time, two different times and two championship teams and you can't ask for anything more than that. No, you can't. Then Jimmy, I hope you enjoyed your time uh, on the show. I know Mark did, and I know I did. How about coming back? Uh, say another month. I definitely want Jimmy coming back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Because we didn't even touch on some things. We didn't even touch on Gene Mock and all these other good things. Jimmy, we definitely have to have you back if you'd like to. Yeah, I would love to come back. You guys just let me know when you have the time available, and I enjoy I enjoy doing this. All right, hold the line, guys. Don't hang up. This is how I end the show. Folks, as you see, we had a good time uh, today with Jimmy and uh, his stories of the 60s and 70s. As always, in the immortal words of Edward R. Morrow, good night, folks, and good luck, and we'll see you next time on Genesis.